Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is October the 19th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I trust that you are loving Jesus this morning and that you are hungry for the word of God. Now, I want to take a moment to respond to a question from a viewer, and I want to thank you for that question. Often, I may come across as making simple or light of things that you consider to be important. And I don't want to overlook many of the issues that are important to you, so your questions are necessary. You see, I understand that we all must crawl through the scriptures before we learn to walk through the scriptures. And yet those of us that are walking through the scriptures sometimes forget the importance or even the principles of crawling through the scriptures. So again, if you have questions, there is no dumb question. And I don't mean that as a cliche. I mean that seriously. There is no dumb question. Please pose your questions to me and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, the question was, what is the difference in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ? And to be honest, there is no difference. And so allow me to explain. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us the qualities of those who will enter into the kingdom. He says in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, if he expects us to be poor in spirit, he himself is poor in spirit. He said, blessed are they that mourn, so he mourns. Blessed are the meek, so he is meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, he himself hungers and thirsts after righteousness. He says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who were persecuted for righteousness' sake. These are the qualities that was instilled within him. And within him was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God. We see that at his baptism. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descends upon him. And so the Spirit of Christ, or the nature of Christ, is the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. That You'll find that in verse 8. He that loveth not does not know God for God is love. Well, what is love? Well, we'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 4. It says, love suffers long. Love is kind. Now again, look at these attributes or look for these attributes in the person of Jesus. Jesus suffered long. He was patient. Jesus was kind. And I say was, he's still alive, so he still is, but we're speaking of his time on earth. So he was patient. He was kind. He never envied. He did not puff himself up. He was not proud. He never behaved unseemly. He was never easily provoked. He did not rejoice in sin. He only rejoiced in the truth. He bore all things. He believed all things. He hoped in all things. He endured all things. He never failed in verse 8. Love never fails. Well, love is God. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. And we see the manifestations of the spirit in Christ. And we should see in ourselves and each other's, as we call ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, in these characteristics, these attributes, these expressions of the spiritual nature that we see listed here. Now, we also see them again in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. It says, the fruit of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, is love. So everything that we just talked about, everything that love is, kind, patient, compassionate, merciful, hoping in all things, enduring all things, never failing, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And from that love comes joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all the attributes of Christ, 
all the characteristics or the personality that we see in Jesus Christ. And so again, the question was posed, what is the difference in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ? There is none. And so when we are told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, to walk as Jesus walked, it's speaking of walking in the Holy Spirit, walking in the nature of love. Again, as we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, being patient, being kind, never envying, never being proud and exalting ourselves, never behaving in an inappropriate manner, not allowing ourselves to be easily provoked, never rejoicing in sin in the downfall of another, only rejoicing in truth, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping in all things, and enduring all things. This is the Spirit of Christ, friends, and this is the Holy Spirit. And this is why we are told in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, we are not in the flesh as followers of the Lord Jesus, but we are in the Spirit of Christ. If so be that the Spirit of Christ dwell in you, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so I hope that answers your question. I hope that you see that they are one and the same and why there is such a need for us, his followers, to experience an exchange of heart, an exchange of spirit, so that we don't walk in the same selfish and proud spirit that we once did, but now we are filled with the Spirit of Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Well, with that being said, we are at a halfway point in our conversation in the book of Job. All three friends have responded to Job, Job has responded to them, and now they are going to each speak once again with Job responding to each one. And so we began with Eliphaz, then was Bildad, and finally Zophar. And so again, Eliphaz answers Job, and this time his rebuke is very strong. It says in chapter 15, verse 1, Eliphaz the Temanite then said, Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind or with hot air? And he's speaking of himself. Should I even take the time to respond to you, Job, because everything that you're saying is just hot air? Verse 3, should a wise man reason with unprofitable talk or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? You speak as a man who has no fear of God, and you do not restrain yourself before God. For your mouth uttereth thine iniquity, and you choosest the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, Job, not I. Yea, thine own lips testify against thee. Are you the first man that was born? Were you made before the hills? Have you heard the secret of God, and do you restrain wisdom to yourself? What knowest thou, Job, that we know not? What understandest thou which is not in us? Now notice what he says in verse 10. He says, With us are both the gray-headed and the very aged men, much elder than thy father. So as we pointed out in an earlier video, these men are aged men. They are well beyond the years of Job. And that's one reason Job looks to them for wisdom. Now what they are doing here is what Paul warned Timothy against. Just because you are an older wise man doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot learn something from a younger man. But they've placed themselves in a position of authority because of their age. And so they're speaking down to Job. They're looking down on Job because of his youth compared to them, even though Job is an older man, and they act as if they can learn nothing from Job. And so much of the argument that they present, we have already addressed. And These arguments should not be overlooked. They certainly should be pondered, meditated upon, and read. So I would encourage you to continue to read each day the chapter that we're going to talk about. And even Job's responses are going to be much of the same. And that's why this young man, Elihu, who has been present through all of this, finally is going to say, I've had enough. I can't stay quiet any longer. I've given you Older men, you that are my figures of authority, I've given you opportunity to speak, but I agree with Job. You've said nothing that would be considered wisdom that would answer Job in his time of grief. 
And so while I won't spend a lot of time on the same things that we've already talked about, there are some key points that we can address out of each of these responses that can bring insight on how we are to live before the God whom we serve. Now in verse 15, Eliphaz is making the point that Job should put very little trust in himself. He says, even the Almighty doesn't put trust in his saints. Now when he says saints here, that's really the word angels. So he says, he doesn't even put trust in his angels. The heavens are not clean in his sight. And compared to his glory, how true this is. He continues in verse 16 and says, How much more abominable and filthy is man, who drinketh in iniquity or sin transgression like water. And so basically he's trying to point out to Job that Job is a sinful man. And this is why Job is being punished. And so he spends the rest of his speech pointing out to Job the conditions of a sinful man in hopes that Job will see in himself what Zophar is illustrating. And we'll learn tomorrow that Job gives no significance whatsoever to what Eliphaz has said once again. And Job is going to continue to defend himself before his friends and before God as a just and righteous man, having done nothing to deserve what has come upon him. And with that, we'll close. But let us be reminded again of what was said in verse 15 and 16, that the Holy One puts no trust in his angels. The heavens themselves are not even clean in his sight. Now, when he says the heavens, he's not talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the atmosphere, the space the distance between the earth and the kingdom of heaven. And most likely that is because that is where Satan resides. You'll remember that we are told that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And that's what it's speaking of. And so he says, not even the heavens themselves are clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is Don? How much more abominable and filthy is fill in your name in the blank? And so let us leave this morning knowing that left on our own, we would be the most vile, wretched, sinful creatures ever walk the face of this earth. It's only through the Spirit of Christ, which we talked about at the beginning of this video, who now lives within us, that compels us and gives us desire to know God, to serve God, to learn of God. So the very act that you are here today should represent to you that the Spirit of God lives within you. Your duty as a follower of Jesus is to feed the Spirit of God, to nurture the Spirit of God, so that He can grow strong and mighty within you, so that your flesh can become puny, weak, and deprived, and no longer have control over your life. Well, friends, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I'm so thankful that you're again here with us. Now, I pray that your journey will be blessed today. I pray that your heart will be uplifted in praise. I pray that your eyes will be open and aware to the things of God happening around you. And I pray that your hands will be busy loving and serving others as Jesus himself loves and serves us. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I love you. I'll see you on the next video.